He's still on the floor! He's still able! Preacher, let's take it off the big act of God and fix what I'm going to do. That's what we're talking about here. The very God that spoke the world into existence in six days, and he didn't need six days to do it, he could just smoke it. Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Um, a lot of you that are students of Scripture know that this is the story that God pre-told us, prophesied to us that Jesus would come, live, and die on the cross. This is Easter week, but let me encourage you that we should, rather than call it Easter week, which is the name of a, a goddess of fertility, let's call it resurrection week. Amen. Isn't that really what it's all about? This is the day that we celebrate that Jesus come in riding on the colt. They laid down the palms before them. And if you're students of prophecy, you know that they'll do that again in heaven. They'll lay down the palm branches in heaven, which tells us that heaven is a green place. It's a beautiful place. We don't think about that, do we? But that's what the Bible says in Revelation. They brought him in and they exalted him as king of kings, but you'll find out only one of those that was in the crowd was there, or just a couple that was there, his mother and a couple of ladies, and John was the only one that was there when he was crucified. You see, it's easy to brag on him when things are convenient, but when things get tough, many people bail. Do you love the Lord for who he is? And I want you to understand that that is the point of the message today is, and here's the title, Who Hath Believed I Report? Who would believe about a Jesus that we're talking about? Who would take him for who he is? Many folks will be offended in the world by the preaching that we'll share today. And I pray today that you will see that Jesus needs to be seen for who he is. He is Savior. He is Lord. He is Master. And I pray he is of your life. If you don't know him today, friend, the best thing you'll ever do is be saved. You don't know what you're missing. Amen, church? The blessings of God. We're going to read this, the whole chapter, but we're only going to preach a few verses Isaiah 53 says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? I pray that you can say me in that verse. Verse number two, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. When I break down verse number two, some of you will get mad at me. Look at verse three. He is despised and rejected of men. He is a man of sorrows. Folks, listen, he bore our burdens. Amen. And acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. So I don't know if you're getting how deep and powerful these verses are. Verse 4, surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes, oh, praise the Lord, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Oh, church. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off the land of the living. There it is, the cross. For the transgression of my people, there's the purpose for your sin. Was he stricken? He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich of, the, of death. There's the prophecy of Joseph of Arimathea. 
Now, y'all need to get this, and I'm not going to come back to this. This was prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus came. See, preacher, why should I be a Christian? Because only God's Word can tell us the events that will come years in advance before they ever come to pass. And it's 100% accurate. That's a big reason why I am a Christian. I'm a Christian because Jesus died for me, and I know the truth of the gospel is plain. God's Word is infallible. It's perfect. Amen? Look on. Goes on and says, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I hope you get that verse. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, things are turning around now, aren't they? He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many? How many can say I'm one of them? Amen. Amen. For he shall bear their iniquities. What is iniquities? Sin. Now watch verse 12. This ought to get amen out of any of us. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. That's prophecy there. We're not getting to that today. But look, it says, Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he hath was numbered with the transgressors, he was hung between two thieves, numbered among the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession. Where is he? He's not dead. He's making intercession for every one of us here today. That's one of the greatest verses in all the Bi chapters in all the Bible, Isaiah 53. Let's pray. Lord, as we come today, I pray, dear God, Lord, that Holy Spirit allow them to see Jesus and who he really is. Oh, God, we're so unworthy of what he did on Calvary. Lord, we thank you, dear Jesus, Lord, for those of us that are born again. Lord, you bore our iniquity. But, Lord, it wasn't just for those that are saved. It's for all. And, Lord, I believe there are folks here today that needs to be saved. Let them understand who Jesus is, who he really is. And let them come to know you as Lord and Savior and Master of their life. Oh, God, I pray. Lord, let us as Christians get a grasp, a mental picture of what Jesus did for us. Unworthy are we. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah made the statement, who can believe our report? In the world we live in today, people don't want to hear about Jesus, who he really is. They want to hear about the Jesus that okay sin, which does not exist. Nowhere in God's Word will you find out Jesus okaying sin. But that's the way the culture has perceived Jesus. He was a loving, permissive. Listen. What about when he threw the money changers out of the temple? How permissive was he then? Amen? Amen. What about when he came to the woman in the well and said, You are a sinner. You've had several husbands, and the one you're with now is not yours. Is that permissive? No. no, but that's the way the world wants to portray him. I want you to see Jesus, who he really is. Jesus Christ was a Savior who come not to live, but he came to die. Listen, I heard a preacher on the radio. A good friend of mine was on the radio preaching yesterday, and he said this. He said, Life is uncertain, but death is for sure. Amen. Life is uncertain, but death is for sure. We don't know if we'll live, but we know we're going to die. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And the day is coming when a preacher is going to stand if rapture don't rapture us out, which I'll have his vote for rapture. Amen. A pretty good way to go, amen? Where the preacher will preach over you, they'll bring you up in a church or wherever it may be, and then somebody will say some words over you. Can I tell you what I'm going to say? If you're a child of the king, I'm going to brag on God. If you're not a child of the king, I'm going to warn your family. You better get right. That's right. Amen. I'm not going to preach anybody into heaven. No. Can all you say amen? amen? You need to preach your own funeral amen. before you die. Amen. When Slisa dies, I'm going to tell everybody, lays before you is just the shell, the nuts in heaven. <laughs> amen. That's good, isn't it? Terry, write that down, brother. That's good. Now, all of us are going to face death. But I'm telling you, there's one way you better not face death. You better not face death without Christ. And the only way to face it with Christ is you must accept him as Lord and Savior. 
I don't know how many funerals I've preached of people that thought they had plenty of time that died in car wrecks or accidents or heart attacks. They thought they had plenty of time. Young people. Yeah. I've preached the funeral of kids in school that had programs that they was going to be a part of. Folks that was in the children's home we worked with. Kids that left and e got into eternity without a chance to be saved. When I say a chance, they rejected their chance to be saved. And there may be somebody here today that say, Preacher, I don't want to die lost. I'm telling you, today is the day of salvation. Don't you turn Jesus away. You be saved today. Look at verse number two. And this is going to be a verse that will offend you. And I want you to get these, this, verse two and verse three. And I broke this down so you can take notes. I've alliterated it. Say, what's that mean? Some of you say, what's alliterated? That's where they, all the words kind of go together. It's kind of a fancy thing that I don't do very often. Number one thing I want you to see is the person of Christ. The person. Who is he? Who is this Jesus? If you listen to some preachers, they'll tell you one thing. If you listen to other preachers, they'll tell you another. If you listen to the world, they'll tell you another Jesus. But I'm telling you who God says he is. And that's the only thing that really matters. Who does God say his son is? And you've got to accept Jesus on God's terms. And I'm here to tell you, if you're not willing to surrender your entire life to him, you didn't get saved. You just bumped an altar. It's all you've done. God says, I'll have all of you or I'll have none of you. Now watch this. And I want you to catch something in these scriptures. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Now, how many's ever done any gardening? Come on, there's more rednecks in here than three. How many's ever heard of suckering your tomatoes? Or as we say, suckering your maters? Karen has no idea. She's a city girl. She don't know what we're talking about when we're talking about maters, maybe. But what does it mean when you sucker your maters? You go in between the branches. There's that little thing that sprouts off there. you got to pinch it off so your tomatoes will grow bigger. That is the exact word. If you look in the Hebrew, that is the exact word for tender plant. Jesus grew up as just a nobody. Now, that's going to offend some of you, but that was on purpose. God did that on purpose. And that's the only place in all God's word that word is used. That's pretty unique. God uniquely called him a sucker or a tender plant. Yeah. Now, some of you are already starting to bow up on me. I can see your face. <laughs> Say, Prince, I can't believe you said that. That's what God said, not what the preacher said. Well, so I wish y'all could see what I'm looking at. A lot of angry, self-righteous, arm-crossed folks. No, I'm just teasing. Now, look on. And as a root out of dry ground, in other words, what's a root in dry ground good for? And a whole lot. It's nothing to be bragged on. He's not something fancy to look at. Look on. He hath no form nor comeliness. In other words, he wasn't handsome. Now, some of you are mad at me already. He, wasn't, he didn't stand out as a beauty queen or a beauty winner or somebody that's handsome or he wasn't muscular or he wasn't, people didn't seem that way. Now, I know. I look at your face. I'm telling you what God says. Y'all following me. In other words, you wouldn't be attracted to him by his looks. I'm going to tell you something that is going to really offend you. But it breaks my heart to see people try to draw pictures of who Jesus is. I hate it. First of all, they ain't got no clue. And second of all, they try to make him somebody he's not. They try to make him beautiful and attractive. And it's not that way at all. Now, I ain't going to get no amen. Boy. Hang on, we'll get to something you can... Holy amen a little bit, okay? A lot of you is already saying, Preacher, you done lost me. Jesus come intentionally not handsome right. or not something physically attractive on purpose. He did it on purpose. Right. It was intentional so people would not come to him for his looks. And would you not agree in our culture that the rich and the beautiful seem to have a foot up? That's, right. yeah. That's exactly how you operate. That's how the world operates. And God said it's not going to be like that with my son. Somebody say amen. That's why you won't see in this sanctuary any pictures of Jesus, no portraits of Christ. You won't see that. As a matter of fact, I don't care if you throw them all in the garbage. Jesus' picture, it is not him. I ought to get an amen out of a preacher or something. It's not him. And I don't believe we ought to make graven images out of stuff anyhow. Somebody say, come on now. Like your foot's tapping, the shirt, church is shaking. You're so disgruntled already. That's what God said. If you don't like it, take it up with him. Tell me how it turns out for you. Everybody with me? 
How many agree that's what God said? There was no beauty that we should desire him. Right there in God's word. Verse 3, he is despised and rejected. The world hated him, and the world still hates him for who he is. Hey, listen, people love to talk about Jesus until they talk about Jesus says sin, sin. People love to talk about Jesus when he talks about all things that God could give me. People love to talk about Jesus, amen, Brother Roger, whenever it comes time to say, hey, listen, I'd like to go to heaven, but on my terms. People get offended, though, when you say you must be born again. People get upset when you say you got to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, not for the pretty stuff, hello, but for the sacrificial things. You need to get this straight. Salvation is not just for here and especially not specifically for here. It's for eternity. This life is a sacrificial life in which you give to him. And if you're not willing to give it sacrificially, you didn't get saved. God will take all of you. He'll have none of you. Come on, church. Boy, oh boy. Tony, it's going to be a long morning. He wasn't pretty. He wasn't handsome. You wouldn't have looked at him and said, boy, he's something special. You wouldn't have ever thought it. Kind of like your pastor. But I'm telling you this, and I said that's funny. I'm telling you this. The outside may not mean much, but who he was was everything. Amen. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is master. And the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. And the world don't like to hear what I just said. He isn't pretty. He isn't fancy. He isn't ornate. He is simply the son of God, which is a mouthful. Amen. That's the person of who Jesus was. I want you to look now at the passion of Christ, of who Jesus is. Look at verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs. The word grief there literally means punishment. He's bore our troubles, our trials. Our, he took on us what we should have took on ourselves. He went to Calvary when we should have went to Calvary. But the Lord knew that there was no sacrifice on this earth, not even yourself, that was worthy to pay for your sins. So he sent his son. Look on. Look at verse number in the verse 4 says, smitten of God. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Y'all need to get this. A lot of us believe that the Pharisees had Jesus killed. A lot of folks believe that the Romans had the Jesus killed. And to this date, I still know preachers and deacons that have hard feelings against Jews because it was the Jews that sent Jesus to be crucified. What did that Bible just say? It was God that had him killed. Be careful of pointing fingers where God did not. God, the Bible says very plainly, smitten of who? Smitten of God. Amen. He was smitten of God. God allowed him to go to Calvary. God allowed him to be beaten. God allowed him to be punished for something he never did. They shoved the crown of thorns on his head. Amen. And the Bible's, listen, if you know anything about this, not these little briars we got around here, they're three inches. Yes. And they shoved them into his head. And on that if you do any history, those toxins that are on that thorn that lived in those, his, his scalp literally swole. Where his eyes almost swole shut. His, his skin swole out to the crown. He was disfigured. And it wasn't Jesus' fault. But God said, that's how it's got to be. Look at the 52nd chapter and look at verse number 14. This is a verse that you ought to write down and remember. And some things I'm going to say in the next couple of minutes is going to sound a little offensive until you get the gist of what God said. And we need to be reminded of this, especially this week, of what Jesus did for us on Calvary. Verse, chapter 52, verse 13, 14 says, As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Literally what that verse means is, when he went to Calvary and hung on Calvary, his appearance was so marred, so scarred, so beaten, so swollen, so whipped, so tore, that you would not have known him if you walked with him your whole life. More than anybody else have ever suffered. And more than the sons of men. Literally what that saying is, God allowed his son to be bruised for us and he was so, bur so broken that on Calvary, you wouldn't have known him. One preacher says it may be the reason that they wrote the name, that God had inspired them to wrote the name over top of him, King of the Jews. 
so the people that saw him would know who he was. I'm telling you, church, I don't deserve that. What am I? What is about me that God loved me enough that he would allow his son to, be su to suffer such a punishment? But the passion of Christ says, Tony's worth it. Chris is worth it. You're worth it. And he chose, and you'll find out later, he gladly allowed his son to go to Calvary. Because your value was so important to God. Here, friend, if you don't know Christ as Savior, you need to get this. Jesus loves you more than you'll ever imagine. You, don't, you can never comprehend the love. Those of the students of prophecy, let me give you a little peace. And I love this. Jesus said in the 14th chapter of the book of John, Behold, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go, I'll come again. When he says, a place for you, he says, literally it means in the Greek, a place designed with you in mind. If you're a Christian, you know God went, Jesus went to prepare a place, and there's not another mansion in heaven like yours. It's not just a bunch of mansions all looks like your mansion is unique. That shows you the love that God has individually for each of us. Isn't that amazing? What a day it'll be when God reveals those things to us. He goes on and says, but he was, verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. And there's so much there. I don't have time to get into it all. Was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. You got to get this, church. <coughs> Pilate was a people pleaser. He was a pansy. He was a sissy. He didn't want to stand and make the decision that needs to be made. He knew he was innocent. His wife even told him so. And by the way, when your wife says, it's got to be true. It does have nothing to do with this just man. So rather than having him crucified, he tried to appease the people. I'm telling you, preachers, teachers, leaders, don't you ever try to please the people. Amen. You please God. Amen. Let God take care of the details. Right. Please people, you'll end up being on TBN. So it's just, there's some good ones on there. I'm just teasing. One or two. Maybe three. Now listen. Y'all follow me, right? So Pilate said, I'll have, him, I'll have him beaten. The law was that he could be beaten 40 times, save one. So 39 stripes. And I'm not talking about a whip, which would have been bad enough. I'm talking about a cat of nine tails, which was various lengths of leather on a handle. And on the tips of those was pieces of bone, steel, and glass, each designed for a specific purpose. The steel designed to break bones, which none of Jesus' bones was broke. The glass designed to rip, and the bones designed to puncture. Three of each on this cat of nine tails. And when they would not use it like a whip, they would use it and they would wrap it around the body and it would wrap and they would rip it loose. Some doc, Christian doctors believe it's possible his organs, internal organs was exposed. Ribs. Why, preacher, would this happen? Because the passions of Christ says, you are that important to me. Christian, I want you to hear this. There's coming a day when you'll see him. And when he reaches out his arms to embrace you, you can look in his hands. And you can see the scars. Isn't that what the Bible says? He said, Thomas, it's me. Look at the hole in my side. Look at the scars in my hand. No doubt there was the puncture wounds of the cross or the, 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 the crown. Look, when you see him, Every time you see him, you'll be reminded of oh, the love that God had in his son for you. By his stripes, we are healed. I mean, you say, thank you, Lord, for what you've done for me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Whew. Verse 6. Oh, we like sheep have gone astray. Aren't you glad that God sent a shepherd for wayward sheep? That's the passion. And I've got to hurry. Look down to verse number 10. I want you to see the purchase of Christ. You may not agree with this, but you had nothing to do with salvation but faith. 
all of it was purchased by Christ on Calvary. It took a ransom to pay for your salvation. There was nothing you could do. You was captive to your sin. And you were hell bound without a Savior, without any hope. That's right. Until Jesus came. Amen. The purchase. Look at verse number 10. The purchase. Yet it pleased the Lord. I want you to underline the word pleased. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Oh, I can't imagine that. It was God's desire to have his son suffer because he hates sin that much. Yet he loves you so much he can't imagine. Amen. Matter of fact, one preacher said it this way, Jesus loved you so much he'd rather die than live without you. Yeah. And that's true. He suffered so much and it was the pleasure of God. Can you imagine the heart of God as they whipped him? As they drove the nails in his hand. And then when all the world's sin, pre or post, was piled upon Christ, and God turned his back on his son who he loved. Jesus cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The only time in history, all eternal history, that God ever turned his back on his son. Not because of his son, but because of the sin his son bore. It pleased the father to bruise the son. Yes. And I cannot comprehend that. I am so unworthy, church. But that's the heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And God the father. He loves you so much. So preacher, I'm not worthy of that. Not a one of us are. None of us are worthy. None is righteous. What does it say? No, not one. But he loved you so much. He willingly allowed his son. It pleased God to see him suffer. Whew, what a verse. The purchase was made. Now, I want you to hear me. Listen to this. There is a world full of religious people. Hillsborough's no different. That feels like if they'll be good enough, God will let them in his heaven. If you could be good enough to get in, there would be no need for a savior. There's a bunch of folks around us, religious people, good people, that believe because they're a member of a church, they can go to heaven. There's folks around us that believe if you follow the sacraments, the list of the things that the church says that they are to follow, that they'll get to go to heaven. Those things, if they were been good enough, there'd have been no need for a savior. I say to you that the only way to heaven, and don't you miss this, the only way to heaven is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless you've been born again, you will split hell wide open and you'll spend eternity in misery. There is only one way. It's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you choose to use a different way, you may feel better and still go to hell. Religion is a scary thing. Folks believe that because I'm good enough, because I pay my tithes, because I do good things, or because I'm as good as a church member, I'm going to heaven. Can I tell you, church people are only different because, it's about Christian church people, because they've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. We're not perfect, but we're forgiven. How many can say, I thank God and I'm forgiven? Praise the Lord. It's heavy stuff this morning, isn't it? The purchase of Christ, verse 10 says, Goes on and says, he hath put him to grief. What a word. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. I don't have time to break this verse down like I'd like to. But to make his soul an offering for sin. If you was a Jew in that day, you'd understand this verse better. They would choose a lamb without spot, without blemish. They would bring it in. And the New Testament talks about where they sacrificed, where they cut and the blood at Bethesda. There's a lot of history there, a lot of amazing stuff. But they would take and they would offer this innocent little lamb as a sacrifice for the sin of the people. Jesus Christ became our lamb. I've told this story before, but I believe it's important to say it again. When I was a young fellow, 
I know some of you have our time believing that, but I was once upon a time a young fella. Tony was there. He was a young fella at that time too. But we lived in Germantown at the time. And there was a fellow in our church, his name was Harris, and he had a meat market. And I remember him telling this story, and I was just a little guy. Back in those days, they butchered things different than they do today. Now they take them through an assembly line, they shock them. They, and a lot of you think that, a lot of you young folks think that hamburger comes from Big Macs mm -hmm. at McDonald's. They actually come from cows. <laughs> do you guys understand that? Some places I preached, they didn't get it. But he would butcher cattle, he would butcher goats, he would butcher pigs, chickens, whatever. No big deal. He got into where he was kind of callous to it. But somebody brought him in a sheep to butcher. And what he would do, he had a chair in his slaughter room, which was all concrete. A lot of you have been in one, know where they can hose it down. What he would do is he'd slit the throat of whatever he was going to butcher. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but that's how it's done. A lot of you look at me like, what in the world? And then he allowed it to bleed out. Anybody too offended? Y'all on with me? And then he'd go over and sit in his chair and wait for it to die. They brought in the sheep and he went over and he slit his throat. And he went over, walked over and sat down in his chair. When he sat down in his chair and turned around, that sheep walked over and put its head in his lap. Oh, wow. That is tough. Oh, wow. And there that sheep bled out and died right there in his lap. Oh, Ain't that what Jesus did? Mm. He was a lamb led to the slaughter. Never opened his mouth. And the very one that sent him there, you and I, he loved us to the point it was just okay for you. That is powerful. In Revelation, you'll see Jesus as the slain lamb. Amen. But I am glad because of his blood, my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Heavy stuff. And the last thing I want you to see is the purpose. Why? Why was this done? Look at verse 11. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. We're talking about Christ. He'll see what his work has accomplished and he'll be satisfied. Oh, that's so good. Hey, listen, when you come to the Lord, he is so pleased. The hardest pain of Calvary, I still believe, is when people are rejecting. Hurts worse than any nail or any whip. Or any crown. The purpose was. It goes on. It says in verse 11. And it shall be my righteousness. Uh, his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. His purpose is to justify. In children's church as a kid. You may have learned how this word is defined. Justify is just if I'd never sinned. Justify. To stand me in correct status with God. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, I am justified. I am a child of the King. It is as if I have never sinned. My sins are cast in the sea of forgetfulness, never to be remembered again. He justified me. He ransomed me. And what does it say? It says, shall my righteous service justify how many? Many. I pray today, if you don't know him, that you'll be one of the many before you leave today. Goes on in verse 12, and this is the good verses where we'll close. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Watch this. It says, Because he hath poured out his soul unto death. Now that may verse may just slip by here. He poured out his soul unto death. When they started, listen, what would you have done if you'd have been in this place of Christ? The first time they drew that cat of nine tails, I believe it had been time to quit. But he poured out his soul. In other words, he continually allowed it to happen because he loved you. He poured himself, completely poured himself out for you. Look on. And he was numbered with transgressors. You all know that. He hung between two thieves. 
Here's the, here's the hallelujah part. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Can I be honest? And if you'll be honest, you'll agree. I'm a transgressor. You're a transgressor. Whether you're a sinner or a saint, you're a transgressor. You're a sinner. Us Christians are sinners saved by grace. We're no better than anybody else. Everything that's done to God be all the praise and all the glory. Christians have this idea that I'm a Christian. I'm better than you. Christians ought to have the idea I'm a Christian. I am so unworthy what God done for me. That ought to be our attitude. Church, listen. I can point you to the day that I got saved. I know that I know that I know that I'm a child of the king. And I know that if I die today, where I'm going? Can you say I do too? I'm going to heaven. If you do, you ought to be the happiest person to walk earth. But I want you to know something. Hear me. Matthew chapter 7. Matter of fact, I want you to turn over there with me to read it because I want you to see that this is what thus saith Jesus himself, the very lamb to whom we speak of. This is his own words. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. I'll give you a chance to get there. This is important. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Here's what it says. Jesus speaking, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth unto destruction. Say, so, preacher, what do I got to do to go to hell? Not one thing. You, don't have to, you just continue like you are, and you'll end up down that low, you're on that wide path, and you'll go right to hell. Preach, that's rough words. That's what Jesus said. Look on. And many there be which go in thereat. In other words, the crowd is going to hell. The redeemed few are going to heaven. The majority is going to hell. Listen, for those of you, especially those in school, don't you follow the crowd, they're going to hell. You better get on the track with Jesus Christ. And you've got to swim against the flow. Verse number 14, here it is. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto, unto, unto life, and few there be that find it. If you're a child of the King, you ought to be thankful that I found the way to eternal life through the blood of Jesus Christ. You ought to be excited. Thank the Lord. I don't have to worry about hell. Amen. Amen. I'm on my way to heaven. Amen. I found the narrow gate. The reason it's narrow is because many people can't accept it. They want Jesus and their life. Jesus says, you'll give me your life. Anybody that looks back is not worthy. Take up your cross and follow me. But for those that will willingly say, I've got to be saved. I don't want to go to hell. Amen. Man, I'm telling you, the blessings the are so awesome. Yeah. Now I take you back for one last. This is the last verse we're going to cover. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1, this is the invitation. Listen to it as God puts it. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth. The word ho is hey in our words. Or listen, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Can anybody say amen? And he that hath no money. I believe that was written on purpose, just like that, because you can't buy it. Donald Trump ain't got enough to buy heaven. You can't buy it. It says, come and buy and eat. Here it is. Are you willing to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. There is no other way. There is not a Buddhist way. There is not a Mormon way. There is not a Jehovah Witness way. There is not a Catholic way. There is one way. You must be born again. Amen. Anyone that adds to that or takes away from it is not salvation. Can you say, Christian, I am so glad that I found Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen. I pray that to the Christian you'll be reminded this week of what Jesus did for you. Christian, thank God for the fact that somebody told us about Jesus. Right. Bless you, Lord. 
to my lost friends here today, I want you to hear me. Jesus loved you so much, he went to the cross for you, individually, for you. He loved you so much that he can't imagine heaven without you. He knew how awful hell was and didn't want you to go there. You need to understand that God sends no one to hell because he hates them. He loves them. He hates sin. And if you're here today and you're a good person, you'll go to hell just like the bad ones will if you've never been born again. I say, hey, if you want to be saved, be saved today. Yeah. Christian, hey, remind yourself of the price it took for your salvation. Whether you're a Christian or lost, this is for all of us. I'm not worthy of what he did. But I thank God that one day I'll see the nail prints and the scars that was for me that purchased my salvation. And would it not be awesome today, Christian, if somebody leaves here today as a child of the king, walked in on the Broadway, left on the narrow, wouldn't that be awesome? Stand with me across the building, heads bowed, eyes closed. Church, you're praying. So important. Church, remember how, how valuable prayer is. Listen to me. Christian, let me talk to you first. Heads bowed, no one looking but me. Listen, Christian, how many here agree with me that we're not worthy, but thank you, Lord. Just raise your hand. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Oh, praise your holy name for what you did for me. One day you'll see him, church. What a day that'll be. You can put them down. But if you're here today, sir, preacher, I know if I would die like I am right now, that I go to hell. I'm a good person, but I'm lost. Let me tell you what we need to do. We want to pray for you, friend. We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to call you out. If you're here today, say, Preacher, I know I need to be saved. Pray for me. Is there a hand in the building? Go up. Somebody just say, Be honest. Pray for me. Pray for me. Is there a hand that'll go up? Somebody say, Preacher, I know I'm, I need to be saved. I know that Jesus is the only way. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to embarrass you. This is a big step in the right direction. Is there a hand go up and say, pray for me? God bless. Somebody else. God bless. Somebody else. Church, you're praying. God bless. God bless you, brother. Somebody else. God bless. Somebody else. Listen to me, church. I want you to pray. I'm telling you today what's going to happen in just a minute if you'll come to be saved. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died for you? And you believe that He is Lord Jesus. He is Master. He's the only way to heaven. If you believe, you can be saved today. What's going to happen is you'll walk down an aisle. You'll come down and you'll say, Lord, save me. And He'll save you just like He saved the preacher or anybody else. And you'll leave here rejoicing with a load lifted off your shoulders like you can't begin to explain. But it'll only happen if you'll agree. Lord, I need you. Save me. Rhonda's going to play. When she, that first note's played, slip out of your seat. Come on. If you want to be saved today, come on. Right now. Come on. Christian, if you need to pray, come on and pray. Altar's open. Christian, if there's somebody on your heart, come and pray. That God will save them today. The altar's open. Come on. It takes a man or a woman. It takes somebody with a backbone to move. The devil's saying, stay there. The Lord is saying, come to me. You see, he loves you so much, he purchased your salvation. His passion is souls. Would you come? People love you, friend. They're praying for you. Say, preacher, I'm afraid. I'm scared. Not nearly as bad as you'll be when God says, hell's your home. Altar's open. God's dealing with some hearts hard. Preacher, I'm afraid. I don't know what to say. I don't, there'll be people here that'll pray with you. They'll show you exactly what you need to do. Come on. You know who you are. God spoke to your heart. He loves you. Slip out of your seat. Walk down the aisle. I've been where you are, friend. I remember thinking that aisle seemed like a football field. I was afraid. 
But I tell you what, when you make that first step, you'll not remember the rest of them. It's that first step that's the tough one. And God will meet you at the second step. I assure you. Come on. We're not going to tarry long. If you don't want to come, we're not going to make you. But there's people here today that know the joy of being a child of the King. And they're praying for you. Church is praying. Heaven and hell is at, at battle right now. And right now, hell's winning. Come on, friend. Come on. Preacher, why are you making such a big deal of it? This is the biggest decision a person will ever make. Come on. Altar's open. Would you be saved today? Would you allow God to write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life today? Would you leave here a Christian today? Choice is yours. Church, thank God for what He did for you on Calvary. The price He paid is far more than anything the world has to offer. Oh Lord, have your way today. Friend, I ask you to reconsider. There's still folks praying. We're not in a hurry. Souls are more important. The most important thing that we'll ever do is souls. And your soul matters to God. Altar is open. I've done all I know to do. Oh, if I could come get you and grab you and drag you, I'd do it. But it don't work like that. That won't save anybody. It's got to be your own free will. Lord, as we come today, Lord, we've done the best we could. We ask, dear Jesus, oh God, that you'll break the hearts of the lost here today. Lord, there was some that raised a hand. There was some that did not. You know exactly who they are. They do too. But I pray, dear Lord, that they're miserable until they accept you as Savior. Because we want them to go to heaven more than we want them to be happy. And then they'll get real joy when they get saved. Let them not leave this building today until they get a hold of somebody that they love or trust. And say, I want to be saved. Lord, for us as Christians, let us be reminded of what you did for us on Calvary. Lord, we're unworthy, so unworthy. And Lord, I pray you let us never forget what you've done. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for all you've done for us. We pray to God you'll have your way in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Ain't God good, church?